as far away as they possibly can, but that's all right. <laughs> Lucky it's a small room. I feel like the microphone's a lot, but I think that's for the online people. All right, how are we going for time? All right, we might make a start. I think we're expecting a couple of others, but um, hopefully they'll trickle in. So good morning and thank you everybody for being here today, either in person or online. Um, I'm Emily, I'll be your MC today and when I'm not dabbling in MC work, I'm the CEO of the Drug Education Network. So before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the strength, resilience and capacity of the Tasmanian Aboriginal people and their deep and lasting cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship as ongoing custodians of the land and waters of La Truita, Tasmania. The Drug Education recognises that our organisation operates on the land of the traditional custodians and we pay our respect to Elders past and present. Dan is proud to work with the Tasmanian Aboriginal community to prevent the harms caused by alcohol, tobacco and other drugs. I would like to say a quick thank you to the Honourable Elise Archer MP who sent her apologies and can't be here today but who sponsored this event so that we could be here at this lovely venue. Today's event represents a combined effort from a number of people and I would firstly like to thank the My State Foundation for providing financial support, not only for this event but also for the printing of the handbook that those in the room will receive today and those online uh, can receive by contacting us after the event. I would like to acknowledge and thank No FASD Australia for partnering with DEN to produce the FASD Prevention and Awareness Handbook and also for their ongoing work in this important area. You will hear more from Sophie Harrington, the Chief Operating Officer from No FASD Australia this morning. Finally, I would like to thank my team for their work in putting this event together. In particular, Denny, Cathy and Zoe, who, are, who were instrumental in pulling everything together, as well as Maria, who you will hear from in just a moment. Events like today are very important, a very important opportunity to raise awareness and understanding, to reduce stigma and to improve outcomes for members of our community. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder remains an underdiagnosed and often invisible disability in our community. By raising awareness, increasing dialogue and improving understanding, we hope to see a reduction in rates of FASD in Tasmania and to see an increase in supports available for for people where FASD is impacting their lives. You will hear from three experts this morning. Each will present separately before we have a shared panel discussion that will provide an opportunity for questions if we have any from the audience. Zoe is our master online facilitator. So if anyone online has any questions for the speakers, please put it in the chat and Zoe will bring those into the room during the panel discussion. After the panel, we'll serve morning tea and you'll have an opportunity uh, to network with those in the room. I would now like to introduce you to Maria Duggan. Maria is an educator with the Drug Education Network, a position she's held for over 10 years. With a master's in social work as well as a master's in public health, Maria has extensive knowledge and experience with uh, contemporary public health practice. That's a mouthful. In particular, Maria is focused on social justice, human rights and respect for all people as drivers for her work in supporting the Tasmanian community to reduce harms from drugs. Among many other things, Maria has undertaken significant work in the area of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, including developing campaigns to raise awareness for FASD, both for dads to be and friends, to support pregnant women to be alcohol free, as well as specifically connecting with younger mums to be and their partners, friends and support people. Maria was also one of the main contributors to the handbook that you'll receive today. Welcome, Maria. Thanks, Emily, and good morning, everyone. And hello to the folks online as well. So uh, I um, just want to ask that you put up the DEN slideshow, if that's possible. That will be fantastic, thank you. That is the DEN one. 
Okay, while that's being sorted, I'll, I'll begin just by saying that it is really wonderful um, that we can be here and with Sophie and Anaga today um, and to be able to present this updated uh, prevention handbook. Thank you very much. Um, and it's, it's such an important resource for health workers uh, and, and for anyone working with pregnant people. Um, and, and I guess the reason why this is such a, an important and necessary tool for your work, as Emily was saying, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or FASD is a serious and complex health and social concern. And it is under-recognised and under-diagnosed. And people with FASD are impacted at varying degrees and their manifestations differ. And the prevalence of FASD exceeds that of other developmental disabilities, but it is less visible and it is further stigmatised. And so to have this event today and to be able to raise awareness and share this new handbook with you, I think is really important because it is about us being able to have more conversations and have more understanding and be able to bring that into our work um, so we can better support people to prevent FASD and also people with a diagnosis that they can get the supports that they need. So the handbook is a comprehensive reference point um, and it really will extend and deepen your understanding of this disability and hopefully provide you with useful information and resources and tools. So what I'm gonna do is give you a little overview of what is in the handbook. Some of you might've already seen the previous version, um, but for those of you that haven't come across this handbook before, um, I'm just gonna provide an overview. So if you could, oh, I can do that, I've got this. So basically this handbook provides a chronology of plans and action. Um, and so you can read about what has been the progress in raising awareness, what's been happening at the national space. Um, and for example, we have the National Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Strategic Action Plan, that is a mouthful, and that's running until 2028. Um, and that particular action plan provides a pathway of priorities and opportunities. And the areas of focus are around prevention, which is a space that DEN really focuses on working on, um, as well as diagnosis, which Anaga is going to talk to in a bit more detail, and support, which Sophie is going to talk about, and management of FASD. There are priorities within this action plan, and, and what enables those is the fact that we need appropriate recognition of FASD as a disability. We really need to eliminate stigma. We need more education and training, policy coordination, research and evaluation. And so I guess it's for you to be able to refer to this handbook and see what's happening and see where you can contribute in this space. There was an Australian Senate inquiry into FASD in 2019, and they concluded that prevention efforts must fundamentally aim to shift societal attitudes and behaviour around alcohol consumption in the broader Australian community. And a longer term strategy and funding for FASD awareness and education must include uh, or be in included in secondary school curriculums. And I guess, as we know, the normalisation of alcohol consumption in our community is, is a challenge. Um, and it's about raising awareness and education, especially with young people, but across the whole community. And we see, and I'll share a couple of campaigns that we have done where we've aimed to broaden that conversation out into the community. The other thing about the um, handbook is that it spells out um, the updated drinking guidelines that were reduced by the NHMRC um, in 2020. And I guess I, I kind of reflect on when I was pregnant, speaking to my obstetrician, um, it's a while ago now, but in, in the big scheme of things, not that long ago, when the obstetrician said to me, oh, a couple of drinks is okay during pregnancy. And I think this is part of the problem is that there's still a lot of confusion. And so we have these new, really clear guidelines now that are spelled out in the handbook. And I guess it's for us to think about how do we share very clearly this message that no alcohol is the safest option during pregnancy. So the other aspect of this, this updated handbook is that it's focused on more inclusive language. Um, and no FASD Australia and DEN recognise that people who do not identify as female or women can become pregnant. And we are committed to improving the health inequities faced by non-binary, transgender, two-spirit, gender-fluid, agender, bi-gender and genderqueer folk. 
and that all Australians have the right to access safe and inclusive health care. Um, and currently, the, the literature that we have um, focuses on the experiences of cisgender women. Um, and in order to accu accurately reflect the available evidence base, um, the handbook discusses the evidence based on this experience. But I think it's really important for us, and this is what's spelled out in the handbook, is to think about how professionals, um, are, when working with people, can really apply their knowledge and the way they work with people for people across the whole gender spectrum. So that is something that's really named up in this handbook. The other aspect is around diagnostic considerations, and that's something that Anago will speak to in a bit more detail. Um, but the handbook spells out an overview of FASD and includes a discussion of primary and secondary conditions. Um, and for those of you who are not really aware, secondary conditions are something that develop over time when there is a chronic poor fit between the individual and their environment. Um, and so it's really important to have that understanding as well as what is the current understanding around how does FASD present. I won't go into detail, but that is named up in the handbook. Um, the other thing that is really useful uh, is around prevention strategies. And so prevention strategies, um, if I just go, oh, sorry, before I go on to that, um, Prevention strategies is something that I'll sp speak about in the next couple of slides, but the other aspects are around gender-centred practice, um, which follows on from that idea of inclusive language, but also about recognising that um, women often experience a lot of stigma around alcohol consumption, and that can be, if they have children, um, really, really difficult and a significant barrier in terms of how they go and access support. And so, Gender-centred practice is, is named up in the handbook and provides you some guidelines and thinking about how do we support women when they are really experiencing these barriers to accessing support. The other aspect um, that is useful for you to refer to in the handbook are the resources toolbox. And in that, we have uh, a way for you to map risk. So if you are working with pregnant people and you need to uh, do an assessment around their alcohol consumption, it can step you through how to intervene, how to support, and, and what that might look like, as well as the five A's um, assessment tool and also the audit C. So all of those resources are in one convenient place for you to be able to refer to and have those conversations and, and support people um, at that appropriate level. So. Uh, that includes uh, a brief intervention around risky drinking, for example, or if someone needs more intensive support, how would you go about doing that? So focusing in a bit more on um, prevention, um, so the handbook goes into quite a lot of detail around what prevention looks like. <clears throat> and people may be aware of the, this, this continuum of prevention that we talk about primary and secondary and tertiary prevention. I guess primary prevention is an area where Dan is working a lot in the school space. Um, and there are a range of suggestions and you can, depending on your context or the setting of where you work, refer to these strategies and think about how you can apply that appropriately. Um, but there are also target groups for prevention efforts that have been named up by the FASD National Awareness Campaign in 2020. And those target groups are women who are alcohol dependent and of, and of childbearing age, women who have a child with FASD and are of childbearing age, and also Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations. So these three groups have been identified as needing increased support to prevent FASD because they face discrimination based on stigma and increased difficulty engaging with supportive services. But I think it's also important to note that <clears throat> Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander and South, Torres Strait and South Sea Islander communities have been stigmatised as communities heavily affected by alcohol and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. But we know that this stigma is actually false and harmful because alcohol is pervasive in Australian society and FASD is not an issue that it's limited to just one community. Um, but I guess prenatal exposure to alcohol and FASD are consequences of this social and cultural acceptance of alcohol use. 
and ready availability of alcohol in Australia. So for this reason, the problem of alcohol misuse is a community responsibility and it does require a community solution. So just to <clears throat> talk about raising community awareness and these are a couple of campaigns that we have run over the last few years. And what we did, uh, you can see the images on the right of screen. Um, this was a campaign that we developed just to get that uh, awareness out in the community and to have those conversations. And this campaign developed in response to the, the research and the evidence that was telling us that we, we have this cohort of older women well-educated women who were drinking alcohol during pregnancy. And so that campaign was specifically targeting that particular demographic. Um, and what we also did is we wanted to think about how we spread the message to women and their partners as well. That that was really important so that when we were promoting this idea of no alcohol is the safest option during pregnancy, we're not just saying to the woman or pregnant person, it's all on you. You have to stop drinking alcohol. So we really wanted to bring in the conversation and the awareness of how partners, friends, family could provide that support. So we actually did some focus testing of that campaign and the messaging with Men's Resources Tasmania to really understand how will this message land uh, with pregnant partners. And so that's, that's the campaign. And that's a little example of uh, doing a campaign to coincide with International FASD Awareness Day. You're probably aware that happens on the 9th of September every year. Uh, and so the Kingston Library were really supportive in doing a wonderful display focusing on healthy pregnancy and what healthy pregnancy looks like. And those resources were available um, for the community to grab. We had little postcards that people could take away. More recently, the um, images on the right uh, is a display that we set up in the Bridgewater Library. And this campaign, um, you can see it's a slightly different uh, graphics and design. And so this was an updated campaign that we chose to focus on with young people. Um, and again, we focus tested the messages with young people at Hobart College. So we got a focus testing group to talk to us about what messages resonate with you, what messages work for you. Uh, and so that was really fantastic to have that input and then to develop this campaign. And as you can see, it's very strength focused, it's very vibrant, and it's really reflecting some very positive messages. Um, and one of those messages you might not be able to see, but you can have a look at the postcards on the table down the back, is about uh, healthy pregnancy. Uh, it's about us being supporting this healthy pregnancy. So we're doing it together. The other interesting thing about this campaign that we ran at Bridgewater was that we wanted it to coincide with International FASD Awareness Day, which happened to be on a Friday last year. So Rob very kindly went out to meet with community members and we'd lined up some community members who've worked on a previous project with us doing storytelling. They'd done a storytelling workshop and that was about how do we have conversations with people in the community about healthy pregnancy? So they were really keen to support us. And so we set up the campaign and we had the display going for the whole week in the library. But it turned out that Friday's a quiet day at Bridgewater Library, who knew? So those community members, uh, you know, they, they were really fantastic because even though we didn't have many people coming into the library on the day to have those conversations, the community members said, that's okay, we'll take the resources and we'll go and share them in our local neighbourhood houses. And so that's what happened. And so I think uh, that, you know, the, the research and the literature says that um, when we're doing prevention, the, the, the best practice approach um, is that we share evidence, we, sorry, we share information in a very strengths focused way. The information is very clear. But if we just share a brochure and there's no conversation, then it's kind of limited. And so we were really fortunate to partner with community members that had learned these storytelling techniques and could go out into communities and share that information with community members. The other thing I would say too, in terms of where we're heading <clears throat> with the um, work we're doing is obviously working in the school space and how do we raise awareness uh, for young people and young women around a safe pregnancy. And I was talking with my daughter, she's 17, and I just asked her, so 
what have you noticed? What, what messages have you heard about um, FASD and, and alcohol in pregnancy? She said, well, my experience has been that we learn about contraception and we learn about how not to get pregnant, but there's nothing else much going on in terms of healthy pregnancy or, or no alcohol in pregnancy. Now, I know that's just one anecdote and that's just one person, but it really highlighted to me how, of course, schools would be doing that kind of work and that's really important and really valid but it does highlight the gap and where we need to do more work in schools to um, have this conversation because we also know that unplanned pregnancy is, is a factor. Um, and so for young women who are becoming pregnant, if they're not aware of these messages, <coughs> excuse me, about being alcohol free during pregnancy, that we really need to share that information. So just to finish up, um, I guess is, to, for, for those of you who want to learn a little bit more about DEN and the work that we do, um, you can always uh, grab these QR codes later or go and check out our website and you can see the other resources that we have developed around alcohol um, and as I mentioned, the postcards that we've developed and the handbook are available for you to take away. Um, so yeah, please help yourselves when the panel's finished and thank you everyone. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I'd now like to introduce you to Sophie Harrington. Sophie is the Chief Operating Officer for NoFASD Australia. Sophie's held many roles in the community development sector, managing regional and national teams. Her broad social sector experience includes senior leadership and management of programs which reduce substance misuse, addictions and homelessness. She's also designed and implemented programs and services to enhance health literacy, life skills and transitions from detention centres and prisons. Her early career work centred on early learning, at-risk at youth and career development services. That's a lot. It's a long very, too, yeah. it? very varied. <laughs> Sophie's come into contact with children, young people and families impacted by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder throughout her career but it wasn't until she joined NoFASD Australia that she learnt for the first time that even low levels of alcohol consumption can have a lifelong impact on a developing fetus. Several years of development concerns, research and adv advocacy for her eldest son led to her eldest son being diagnosed with FASD in 2020. I will hand over to Sophie, thank you. I'm going to put my little shoe somewhere that hopefully won't fall off. Well, I'll put it down here. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of where we meet today and I feel blessed to come here to Tasmania and be able to speak on the land I'm on today. Uh, I've come over from um, Wajuk Noongabudja in Perth uh, to be here today, not just for today, I'm not that lucky. Um, we've got lots of things going on too, but would just like to pay my respects and to any First Nations people in the room from any country here today. So a quick brief about no FASD Australia. So we're the national organisation for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, not no FASD as much as we would love for that to ring true. And as an organisation, our key purpose is to support families and individuals affected by FASD. And we do that through our networking, through working with colleagues like DEN. Um, and thank you, by the way, for having us here today and to be able to be a part of this launch and also uh, to be part of the handbook. It's a fantastic resource. And as an organisation, we really build those connections and provide that essential bridge between clinicians, researchers and individuals to help get the support that they truly need when they are living in a world with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and a world that doesn't understand their disability as a general um, statement. We have a helpline that you can see on the screen at the moment, and that's seven days a week, and also a website which contains a wealth of resources that are free that you can download and are there uh, for anybody uh, from all sectors um, and for parents and caregivers too. So one of the things I think often surprise people when they come to a discussion and learn about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is the prevalence in Australia or the estimated prevalence in Australia. It's believed that the general population of Australia, around between one to 5% of the population are impacted. 
Now, this could be a Sophie kind of, oh, I think it could be about this much. But I'm glad to say there is more evidence behind that. Whilst we haven't had a national prevalence study in Australia, which is something that we advocate for strongly at NOFASD Australia, there have been specialist population studies. But these statistics around the 1% to 5% are based on our understanding of national prevalence studies that have taken place in the United States and also in Canada. And those prevalence studies suggest 4 to 5%. In Australia, our levels of alcohol consumption are higher. And therefore, to assume, if we say around about 4%, it's not just Sophie plucking numbers from the sky. We're looking at potential population um, prevalence, which is much higher than anyone would presume. The specialist population studies that have taken place so far are actually up in the northwest of WA. Go WA. Um, and that study uh, in the Fitzroy Valley region had a result of around about 12% prevalence. The other specialist population study was at Bankshire Hill Detention Centre in Perth. And Banksy Hill, for anyone who doesn't know, is a detention centre that has all young people from WA um, uh, who are in custody there. That prevalence study, which was conducted by the Telethon Kids Institute and a number of other professionals and researchers, demonstrated a prevalence rate of 36% of those young people. That's higher than any other prevalence, specialist prevalence study that's taken place in the world. So we need to really, truly consider this in Australia. This is a massive public health issue. I'm very pleased to say you would have heard Maria talk about the FASD Action Plan. And no FASD Australia is supported by the Australian Government Department of Health and Aged Care to be able to deliver the services and the online support that we do as an organisation. Now, how does that prevalence look when we're talking about other disabilities and other disorders? What does that truly mean? Well, what we know is if we were to assume this 4% prevalence rate, then FASD would actually affect more people than autism spectrum disorder, cerebral palsy, spina bifida and Down syndrome combined. It would be more than twice as prevalent as autism. It's a serious public health issue that we're just not listening to or are not aware of. What I am pleased to say is as many organisations such as DEN and NOFASD and the Foundation for Alcohol Research and Education and NACHO as well, who are in this space amongst others, to really raise that awareness. The Australian Government invested more into public awareness and raising from the National Action Plan than any other country has done to date from a national perspective. And the Foundation for Alcohol Research and Education, who I will refer to as FAIR if I talk about them again, uh, created this video which is targeted at mainstream populations in Australia. Every moment matters in your pregnancy, especially this one. I'm a few days pregnant here. I hadn't even done the test yet, but I'd already stopped drinking alcohol. You see, everything you drink, your baby drinks at every stage of pregnancy. <laughs> and any alcohol can damage their developing brain and organs. So make the moment you start trying, the moment to stop drinking. So as you see, this is targeting community, it's targeting everybody, as Maria said before, around the stigma for mothers and it being a mother's choice and a mother that must need to make all these decisions or a prospective mother. Uh, yet there are those challenges around getting community on board. Now, before I present the next slide, um, I would just like to put out a bit of a safety warning. I would just like to say for anybody who hears what I'm about to share today and it is triggering for you, the 1800 number for NOFASD is available again at the end of the presentation and also on the leaflets at the back of the room. So biological mother's story. You heard Emily when she introduced me in my far too long bio, which reminds me I really need to cut that down, um, that I actually have my own journey with alcohol and my own journey with FASD as a biological mother. My journey with alcohol was one that would probably be very similar to a huge population in Australia. And that's one as a social journey. I am really fortunate, I am very privileged. I haven't got to deal with the extra stigma and the extra challenges of addiction, of substance misuse or substance dependency. I have a roof over my head, I've got an education behind me and I've got wonderful support people around me. However, I joined NoFASD five and a half years ago 
coming to the organisation with, to be fair, my own prejudices, even though I knew a fair amount about FASD, I thought at the time. And I was actually in a presentation in New South Wales, and I remember it as if I'm stood there now. And in that presentation, I remember listening again to all of the red flags around individuals with FASD and what can be demonstrated and what we may see. And I even remember joking with my colleague at the time and saying, God, it could so be my son, but I didn't drink alcohol when I was pregnant. Well, what then flashed back through to me when I looked at one of the slides that were there was around the minimum level of alcohol exposure and that even low levels of alcohol exposure can cause fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Now, when I said I didn't drink alcohol when I was pregnant, I wasn't telling a lie to anyone else or to myself. What I was doing was thinking about when I was pregnant. So when I'd been confirmed at six and a half weeks, what I didn't recollect until that very moment in that presentation was my conversation with my GP at six and a half weeks when my pregnancy was confirmed and telling him, well, the night of conception, I definitely was drinking. And there would be two or three other occasions where across the course of the night, we probably would be talking more than four units of alcohol, more than four standard drinks. So a binge drink. Now, when we think about how much a binge drink sounds like, we make an assumption in our own minds, I think, that somebody must be very drunk, that must be really under the influence. But a binge drink could be four very small glasses of wine. It could be mid-strength beer. It could be two cocktails. It literally could be. So we need to change and help with that stigma and that cycle. My son wasn't actually diagnosed until he was 14. And that's because I was not looking for FASD. I had no idea. And not one health professional asked me if I'd ever drunk alcohol during my pregnancy, despite the many different appointments we took our son to over the years and the assessments. Now, yes, he had many what I look back as and call red flags, but when you don't know what you're looking for and he doesn't meet the, dis, um, uh, the assessment criteria for other diagnoses, you don't know that it could be FASD. So I'm really happy to ask any questions during the Q&A afterwards. I'm very open and I do this a lot, so I'm very comfortable sharing. I won't go into the details now around our son's experience. What I will say is that since we've had his diagnosis at 14, it's changed our lives, but for the positive which some people may find quite surprising. But the difference is now, rather than judging him for the things that he wouldn't do, we now understand it's because he couldn't do them. It wasn't just adolescent behaviour, which I wasn't very tolerable about, or my husband certainly. It was actually about a brain-based disability, and we were seeing the symptoms of that brain-based disability. This is Jessica's story, and Jessica and I and another lady, Angeline Bruce, who sat to the side of Jessica, had the privilege of speaking at a parliamentary breakfast in Canberra a couple of weeks ago. And Jessica shared her story, and I'm not going to say more because she does that so well. So, um, thank you, Honourable Members, and to the Fair team for inviting me to speak today. I'm here to represent almost a million largely unsupported Australians who suffer with this hidden preventable brain injury. My name is Jessica and I'm 37 and four years ago, after a lifetime of difficulty, I was finally diagnosed with FASD. It would take me much longer than the time that I have here to relay the utter confusion and a total despair of living with this injury, particularly when it is undiagnosed. And I stand before you feeling lucky to still be alive. I have endless examples of neurological differences, cognitive and physical impairments, sensory and nervous system deficits, and more that have profoundly impacted my life and the lives of others. The neurological differences of FASD present themselves in a myriad of combinations. It is a spectrum characterised by an uneven neuropsychological profile, meaning that individuals living with FASD may have unique strengths that mask insurmountable difficulties. Let me perhaps address an elephant in the room. My high expressive language, my ability to communicate this to you is my strength. And I'd like to think it is a measure of who I would have been without the damage. It's a nod to my lost potential and the mask that hides these facts. My expressive language may be high, 
But what you don't see is my core audio processing, my rigid and literal thinking, and my cognitive processing delays. Meaning, among other things, that I can't listen and understand as well or as fast as I speak. My nervous, digestive, and endocrine systems are damaged. I have never slept an entire night. I have lived with anxiety since I was four. I have suffered mass depressive disorder since I was 16. I have the math skills of a 13 year old. My impulse control and emotional regulation is impaired and I cannot properly store or retrieve information or the things that I have learned. And it takes me longer and it's harder to learn. I don't always know how to use the information and I, I struggle to problem solve. I cannot properly plan, <coughs> prioritize, time manage, make decisions or initiate tasks to reach a goal without support or assistance. And this list is not exhaustive. What you also don't see is my vulnerability to abuse. Don't be fooled. My ability with words masks a lifetime of being unable to meet the expectations that come with using them. And I needed extensive support to be here today. The immense harm caused by the ignorance, dismissal, ridicule and gaslighting of the medical and then specialised professionals that first my mother and then I sought in the darkest and most desperate years of my life has forever changed me and only clarified the work that must be done. FASD affects every aspect and sector of society. It, in my story, it's not an isolated one. My exposure to alcohol happened before my mother skipped a cycle. Please ponder the implications of that when almost 60% of Australian pregnancies are unplanned. Mm. Awareness is the key to action. Understanding the consequences of prenatal alcohol and FASD more broadly will fuel the action to transform Australian society in all ways for the better. And I hope that we can count on your help. Thank you for your time. I'm lucky to call Jessica a friend as well as also a, an amazing advocate that works with no FASD on our lived experience uh, expert advisory groups. I also know her mum very well and know the pattern of alcohol usage which she experienced and as Jessica explained she was 33 before she received a diagnosis. We regularly have people coming and calling the helpline who are in their 40s, 50s and 60s and don't know why they've experienced so many adverse life outcomes uh, when they feel like they've tried so incredibly hard in life. And keeping in mind that also alcohol dependency and substance misuse disorders are really very common for individuals with FASD as well. So No FASD Australia have been involved, whilst you saw the video from FAIR with the mainstream campaign, we were involved in the priority groups and you heard Maria mention some of those earlier. And we were tasked with um, developing an entry level resource that would help to engage services and individuals who may be at risk or higher risk of alcohol exposed pregnancies through our lived experience expert groups and discussions. And for being a mother who wasn't alcohol dependent but had no idea I had a child with FASD, we worked together to actually develop two key resources which are baseline. There's a poster and an entry level uh, leaflet. One that's of support for people who may be pregnant or could become pregnant um, who are on the journey with alcohol which is of dependence or misuse disorders. And also one for AOD uh, professionals in that space as well to help have that conversation. Uh, there are quite a number of these resources at the back for you to take with you as well. The other area that uh, Maria also mentioned, mentioned was around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and South Sea Islander populations and how having support and information for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and South Sea Islander populations is incredibly important. So that information is done in a culturally responsive and respectful way. And these are also fabulous resources that have recently been re uh, released by Nacho and can be found on their website too. I'm going to end my talk there. I'm going to mention the um, banner that you can see to the side, which says Red Shoes Rock. For those of you that are online, you won't be able to see, but it talks about the journey around the Red Shoes Rock movement and how that was developed by RJ Formanac and how he has, was diagnosed with FASD in his late 40s. And when he was diagnosed, he would wear a suit with red Converse shoes and to raise awareness because people would say, oh, I like your funky red shoes. And he'd say, ah, oh, 
That's because I'm raising awareness of my hidden disability. For anyone who has noticed I'm wearing red shoes, I generally don't wear those with my, um, oh gosh, that's microphones, with my dresses. But these are twoobs, very cool, and twoobs have supported um, FAIR to actually be able to issue lots of pairs of red shoes for us to stand out and for us to be able to raise awareness of FASD. So like DEN have done over the last few years in community, please consider September the 9th as FASD International Awareness Day and we do activities through the whole month to raise awareness. Please do contact us, have a look at the free resources on our website, follow and share on social media because that's how we get our message out there. Thank you for your time. So our last speaker today is Dr. Aniga Jaykar. She has more than 40 years of clinical experience as a paediatrician. She was Professor of Paediatrics at Mumbai before moving to New Zealand 20 years ago. In 2011, Aniga was appointed as a community paediatrician in Hobart and over the years has established the out-of-home care clinics, paediatric outreach clinics, developmental and complex behaviour multidisciplinary team meetings with key stakeholders. In collaboration with FASD Tasmania and Patches Western Australia, Aniga held the initial FASD assessment workshops and developed referral pathways for FASD in Tasmania. I welcome you to the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for setting the scene for me. It makes my life easier. I've been asked to uh, talk on FASD diagnosis and management. But before that, I'd like to also acknowledge the uh, Aboriginal people and on behalf of the Tasmanian Community Pediatric Service, I would like to pay my respects to the Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional and original owners and continuing custodians of Lutrovita, Tasmania. We acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging for they hold the memories, uh, culture, traditions and hope of their people. And we also acknowledge that the health and well-being of Aboriginal children, young people and young people growing up in Tasmania is based on a deep and continuous connection to family, community and country. And we are committed to uh, Aboriginal children having the right to health and well-being outcomes which are equitable to all children growing up in Tasmania and Australia. And I'd like to begin then. How do I do that? Next. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, just looking at the diagnosis uh, as the first part, there are different parts of the diagnosis that we need to think about if we are suspecting uh, FASD, right? Now, as we know, FASD is a spectrum. It was, it was originally called FAS, which is the fetal alcohol uh, sort of uh, disorder of fetal alcohol what was it? syndrome, sorry, yeah. And then we moved it towards a spectrum because there's a whole range of things that can sit under FASD. And the first thing in that is a confirmation of prenatal alcohol consumption. And sometimes that becomes difficult because a lot of families or parents will say, I have had lots of drugs, but I haven't touched a drop of alcohol. And because they don't want that label, and it's fair enough, but we cannot actually move to considering FASD until we have a confirmed prenatal alcohol confirmation, okay? Then we look at the history of what is happening. So the history of the birth, the neurodevelopmental, the psychosocial, the educational, and any medical history that is there. And then we look at some assessment. So growth used to be one of the things where it's a small head and a small child. That is no longer considered a part of the diagnostic sort of criteria. And then we look at the facial features, which are typical, and I'll show you some of them, which are called as sentinel features of FASD, where there's a thin lip, a flat filtrum, and eyes, which are, uh, you know, where you measure the eyes to see whether they're in the range. And even the central features are no longer considered the uh, actual necessity to make a diagnosis. So then we are left with neurodevelopmental domains. That means the brain-based sort of difficulties. And uh, so the assessment for that is complicated and requires a more 
a battery of tests, and I can talk about that later. And these we look at in Australia as per the guidelines for the diagnosis of FASD. And once you have all these aspects, you've got a physical examination, you've got the history, you've got the alcohol consumption and the assessments, then we can make a diagnostic formulation to say whether a child has got fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or no. I'd like to talk a little bit about that picture there. It's a young patient of mine uh, who's a Aboriginal young girl, not, nothing to do with FASD, but she, she's had a quite a significant uh, journey with adverse childhood experiences. And um, she's 18 now. And when we were setting up the Tasmanian Community Pediatric Service and she was, she said she, she drew some pictures for me. And one of them is this. And she said this was really uh, blossoming through adversity. So we've used that as the emblem for our uh, uh, Tasmanian Community Pediatric Service. And I always acknowledge her. Uh, you know, art when I speak on t at any event now. So I'm not going through this, but I really also want to highlight that FASD is preventable, okay? And so, but it is a lifelong disease once it happens. So our focus should be on creating awareness and prevention and managing early diagnosis and supports if we happen to have that secondary prevention thing. So that in capitals, is, it is a preventable disease and our whole attention should be in how best we can educate Tasmanians to reduce the prevalence in our state, okay? It's a teratogen which crosses the placenta and causes develop, uh, damage to the brain, okay? And there's no level, I'm just reiterating it what has been said, because you can't say it often enough. No level of maternal consumption of alcohol is deemed safe. And this this is, you know, when I've talked to medical students, say, oh, the same as what Maria mentioned. Oh, but our doctor said we can, oh, you know, that they've had children and they're okay. Yeah. So uh, that that's true. Some of the lucky ones can escape the diagnosis, but you don't know who's going to be the unlucky one. So it's better to have a consistent message which says no level of alcohol consumption is deemed safe. Okay, And also to remember that the CNS, the brain develops from, say, five weeks of pregnancy. When your diagnosis of alcohol, you know, FASD or even pregnancy is not possible. So minimum harm means if you're diagnosed, then stop drinking. But when you're planning, stop drinking as well. Okay? So that, that's just, I, I needed to say that more, even if it was a repetition. Then we're looking at how do we actually know the consumption? Now, although we said that there's no alcohol uh, consumption, which is deemed safe, one of the tools to get an understanding of how much alcohol the person is drinking is really called the alcohol use disorder identification test and that is what is called as uh, and consumption so it's audit c okay that's what the whole term stands for because everybody asks what's audit c yeah so it is alcohol use disorder identification test for consumption and this was a, a questionnaire which is used for veterans and you know it, or the alcoholic sort of adult population where you're looking at how severe is the dependency but in the pregnancy context, we can still use it. And the scoring is very simple. It's zero to, I'm not going through it. It's zero, one, two, three, four. So you can get a total score of 12. However, the score does not matter as far as what we are concerned, okay? But the questions usually asked are, how often do you have a drink containing alcohol? How many standard drinks containing alcohol do you have on a typical day? And how often you do you have six or more standard drinks? on a single sort of occasion. So like binge drinking. So these are the three standard questions and then they grade it and you can score it. But that's just for a technical discussion that I'm completing the understanding. Then we talked about sentinel features. So sentinel features are really looking at a small head, but uh, you know the, what the features they have, can have a small nasal bridge, they can have epicanthal folds, they can have small eye openings, a short nose, a flat mid face, a thin upper lip, a flat philtrum, small chin, a smooth philtrum, a small chin. And the thing to, the main ones are the eyes, the uh, uh, distance between the two, uh, you know, uh, 
and the philtrum, flat philtrum, and the thin upper lip. And there's a grading for that. And I didn't want to go in technicality, so I've not shown you those pictures. But it's really important to know that we do not have Australian standards for Aboriginal people to decide the, you know, philtrum and the uh, thing. So we are using American standards or we are using, uh, you know, different standards to decide that. So we have to keep that in mind. But also we have to remember that the central features, you need three or more. However, it doesn't matter because you can have FASD without the sentinel facial features, okay? So you, when you're doing a diagnostic formulation, you have alcohol consumption, yes, tick box. Then you have fa uh, facial sentinel features, less than three or more than three. If it's less than three, it's not considered a facial thing, okay? Uh, as a scoring. So I just wanted to bring that up for you all. And then effect on the brain. So this is obviously that the brain ha has, uh, th these are distorted because I've taken it from the net, <laughs> but it's a smooth brain structure. A underdeveloped brain is the real problem. And an average brain will have, you know, a good thinking, planning, and then you in a fast D brain, it'll be all over the show. So it's really scattered uh, sort of disabilities that are there. And when we're looking at diagnostics, so there are sort of nine domains. I'm just going very, very briefly, not into the test. Nine domains that you look at. And if there is more uh, severe impairment in more than three of the domains, it would be considered as FASD. Okay, so one of them is brain structure and neurology, where you can have a small head, uh, you can have some structural abnormalities in the brain when you're doing an MRI. You can have seizures, which are not known because of any other structural cause, and you can have some significant neurological diagnosis. So you could have any of these things if you want to tick this box, okay? The second thing is motor skills. Motor skills are really looking at you know, fine motor skills, balance, strength, coordination, agility. And again, there's a battery of tests which occupational therapists would do to identify whether the motor skills deficit is severe enough, okay? I'm not going to how it's tested. I'm just saying these are the sort of categories. Then cognition, as the brain functioning, as Jessica said in her uh, lovely video, the IQ is one thing, but also verbal skills, non-verbal -re reasoning skills, processing speed, you know, working memory, all of these could be subtle difficulties. You know, they could be subtle patchy difficulties, not necessarily the whole of it, okay? And that's why it's really important to identify, okay, this is not fitting into a, you know, development and delay. This is not fitting into autism. This is not, what is this then? You know, so that, that's the thinking that has to go. And even language, okay, language, receptive language or expressive language. Again, however, it is the severity that has to be considered, okay? It's not just a small, my language really, which be a tick box. So the tests have to be robust. You would do a self-test, you know, and the speech and language therapist would do the formal assessment. Academic achievement, academic achievement, skills in reading, writing, maths, literacy, you know, all of that could be one of the domains. And then this, uh, this is the same one, sorry. Why are there three slides? Oh no, yeah, the f next one is the memory, okay? So the memory is overall memory, verbal memory, or visual memory, any of those. Again, that's t memory testing which is done. Attention, attention is inability to focus, in attention or a combined ADHD could be considered, okay? If it is just hyperactive, that is executive function. So ADHD per se can tick a box if it's a combined ADHD or the inattentive type, okay? And again, it has to be severe, not just a mild ADHD, okay? Uh, then you have something called as executive skills, executive function skills, which is involved in organizing, planning your own thoughts and behaviors in order to complete any task, okay? And that sometimes the goal uh, can be a bit scattered for people. They can't actually, as I showed you the drawing, that brain thing, you know, they can't actually compartmentalize and plan things, yeah? And um, here we can actually look at different tests to do executive function. 
Um, and the last but not the least is the mood and the affect regulation, where you can have anxiety, depression, difficulties in social communication, and you know skills like that, where sometimes autis autism can be part of this whole uh, spectrum. You know, like so you can have autism without a cause, but you can have a tick box about autism, which is a, in the severe end as part of FASD. Right? So we, we, we really get a bit stuck when we are diagnosing neurodevelopmental domains because I find it a little difficult because if you can see, if I have a young child with autism, anxiety and ADHD, which could be without an alcohol consumption thing, yeah? But the minute there is some alcohol consumption, we are pushing them into a label of FASD, and that becomes a bit of a stigma. Uh, and it's always a dilemma that if you can get the supports without the label, is that a better option for maintaining the relationship till the p a person is adult enough to focus on the etiology? But again, that's a matter for discussion. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, then coming to the management principles, so because there are some unique cognitive challenging for more memory, learning, understanding, emotional regulation, you know, you have to think of the whole picture and the behavioral strategies do not have, may not be the standard ones you use in a behavior management plan. Sometimes the rule of exercise is good because it can help, you know, self-regulate, it can help uh, increase the dopamine, it can improve the mood, so exercise could be one of the things which, and children and young people, their management has to be targeted to an individual person. And the, the school support has to be an individual learning plan rather than, you know, sit here and do this work similar to the class. So those are, those are things which children struggle with in schools. Schools don't recognize this hidden disability, yeah? And it's something I think we have to actually advocate for very strongly, that the support has to be tailored to helping the individual child, okay? And some of the things you can do is repetitive stuff to build competence and mastery. I think I can see uh, we're still nodding away there because she does the behavior management stuff. But it's really also giving them some time off, some emotional breaks, helping them to understand their emotions, naming up the emotions and helping them manage it. You know, simple things could be done. Uh, you can use play-based thing, you can use storytelling. There are lots of ways we can actually help manage and support. We can't cure FASD, it's a lifelong disability, and I cannot say it often enough that prevention is better, okay? And then we have to look at whether these children can get NDIS eligibility to provide ongoing supports. And that, again, is sometimes a struggle, but we have to pursue it so that we can help the children, okay? Educational supports are a must in schools, not only in schools, even life skills education, and also education for higher education, you know, uh, skills development, training, supports for life. And uh, one of the things there is, this is the thing about the FASD registry, where if the people who have the diagnosis can register and then they can be part of the uh, sort of any new developments, any research, they can have some ongoing things. And the last thing I, I, is about raising hope and managing expectation, because quite a lot of the time I've seen in the out of home care setting, foster carers are very keen on getting this diagnosis, okay? Because also, as so is child safety. And that is because they feel that the supports would be available. And that's very true. But if they are teenagers and they don't really want to know, I don't know whether we're causing, so it's an ethical dilemma about, okay, we should have the label to get the support, but is that something that we need to do for that child? Is it in the best interest of the child at that point in time? I don't know. I, I'm just putting it there to manage expectations that, and I'm very sure that I would not refer a child until I know the mother has agreed uh, that she has drunk alcohol because I've had to take back a, a 
diagnosis which had been made previously. And this is just sharing an experience where the mum came back and said, Anaga, I don't know who and why this child was diagnosed because I have not drunk a drop of alcohol. Okay, so will you please help take it off? So I said, yes. You know, because we have to respect what she says. And maybe she has drunk alcohol, but there's no he says and she says in this thing because you really want to make sure that the stigma is not, you know, something which is going to damage the relationship. Not everybody is as educated and understanding uh, of how to manage this thing. And I'm sure Sophie can talk to that more. <laughs> but it's really important that we... Uh, maintain that understanding before we label. And I just thought I should, you know, not say we don't diagnose it, but think of the ethics around the diagnosis. And it's more than research and it's more than, you know, labels. It is the lives of the children we're talking about. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anaga. Um, thank you all of you for speaking today. You've certainly brought um, lots of different perspectives to this conversation. And I'm really hearing that unfortunately stigma is still playing a large role around FASD and that's part of why we want to increase the conversation, raise awareness um, and make it okay for people to admit they've had alcohol either knowingly or unknowingly when they knew they were pregnant or didn't know they were pregnant um, and be able to accept the support and hopefully increase the supports that would be available for that individual uh, where their mother has consumed alcohol during pregnancy um, and they're experiencing FASD as a result. So I have a number of questions that I'm really keen to ask, um, but I also want to make sure that everybody in the room and everybody online um, has an opportunity while we've got these three experts in the room. Um, so I might start it off. And we're hearing a lot, um, uh, we've heard from all of you around prevention. We've heard about um, what, what happens, the process of diagnosis, it's clearly very long and lengthy. Um, and involves a number of specialists, uh, from what I understand. Um, and we're also still seeing difficulties, particularly in Tasmania, in Australia more broadly, around understanding, um, around knowledge um, of FASD. And, uh, and from what I'm hearing is that the support, not necessarily today, but in general, the supports that are available where there is a diagnosis of FASD are still quite limited. So I'm really interested to hear from each of you, if there were no systemic and no financial barriers in place, if you could change one thing in Tasmania in relation to FASD, what would that be? Uh, I think that um, no barriers, um, that would look like really comprehensive education um, at, at that high school level, at year 11, year 12. Um, being able to embed um, this understanding across whole class groups um, so that, there, yeah, there is this cr increased awareness around this very clear message that no alcohol is the safest option during pregnancy because I think um, yeah, we just need to get that message out there a lot more. So if we had the resources um, and the funding to do that in every school, I think that would be really, really beneficial. Um, and I think it needs to go, as you're saying, Emily, stigma, it's such an issue around alcohol and substance use. And we know if we take this approach of using good principles of drug education, that looks like a very um, clear information delivered in a non-judgmental way. So it's about doing that in a safe way so everyone gets that information, but no one's feeling like stigmatised or singled out if, if they may be using alcohol or any other substance um, at that age, that, that they get that information uh, and they can use that information for their health and wellbeing. I think following on exactly from what Maria said, I'm very passionate about education in schools because that's where this belongs. Um, 
building on from that, I think, from the perspective of with health professionals and the social message around alcohol as well. I can't tell you how many times I've spoken to people and have anecdotal responses around um, that they didn't know that it wasn't safe to drink alcohol or didn't even assume during those first few weeks, like I didn't either. But also recording that information, having that conversation as a health professional when somebody sits and asks about you know, preparing for pregnancy, including alcohol in that conversation. Often you'll be asked if ever you've been in that position where you've been fortunate enough to fall pregnant, you'll be asked about whether you smoke, whether you use prescription medication and all your lifestyle factors. Alcohol is so socially accepted within Australia. We use alcohol to commiserate, to celebrate, to do everything else. There's no stigma around drinking alcohol. So let's remove the stigma around asking somebody if they've consumed alcohol because it's very, very common. And recording that information. If I use myself as an example, if when I spoke to my GP at the time I told him about my alcohol usage, if that had gone on my health record and my child's health record, at some point along that journey, somebody may have asked me that question and then we wouldn't have had to wait 14 years of struggles to learn because early diagnosis and early intervention is everything. And I think until we can start to remove that stigma on many levels, until we can start to prove um, the, rev the prevalence in Australia, we are going to continue to hide and stigmatise this disability and therefore not ask that question. Is this on? Hello. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so uh, moving on from that, I completely agree with what Maria and Sophie ha uh, uh, has said. And then if we are taking it forward, and we have the documentation. So the stigma is no longer there. The honesty of saying, okay, I've drunk alcohol, I didn't know I was pregnant, or I drank it, I tried to reduce it, is documented in the antenatal notes officially, and you have an audit C tool written out, then we have it known that this child has a, is at risk of FASD, and then if there is no problem with funds, I would follow those children up, as an early in an early developmental clinic and give them the supports, have the proper attachment, have a whole multidisciplinary team looking at if there are any lags, how do we do an early childhood intervention and identify the problems as they are and we will minimize and uh, uh, the damage uh, of the nurturing part of it, although the uh, structure may not be helped and then we can have a better outcome as a potential. So I think no funds is a good idea. No, no restriction of funds, sorry. <laughs> but because we, we, we lack officially the, uh, in the public system, we do not have enough allied health because NDIS has moved them into, a, you know, the private sector. So we need a publicly funded allied health multidisciplinary assessment team across the state, which will follow up these vulnerable children and move them in the right direction at the right time. Thank you. So we need to talk about it more. We need to know our facts around uh, alcohol uh, risk in pregnancy. We need to make it okay. And where there is a diagnosis, we absolutely need to wrap around that child and carry them through and support them to engage in a full and, and fulfilling life wherever we can. Do we have any questions from anyone in the room? Ali. say to you at this point is no <laughs> because the reality is trying to get that prevention messages out there 
is incredibly difficult and the, we do work behind the scenes as an organisation to make those kind of conversations happen or to lead into those conversations. You will see that the Foundation for Alcohol Research and Education were, were funded uh, by the um, Australian government and that has been a, a big push on the prevention message. So we, and I say we because I'm involved in sharing my story quite a lot in those forums, but talking with um, the bodies for allied health professionals um, in the space of the GPs um, networks, psychology networks. So certainly around the allied health and professional space, that's happening a lot. And um, midwives, uh, there's a number of areas like that. In the family planning space, it's, it's still on, it's still a work in progress, absolutely. Something for us to work on together then. Yeah, I'd like to respond to that too, Ali. I think um, just having recently had a conversation with Family Planning Tasmania, I think they also recognise it's a really tricky space, unplanned pregnancy, and how do you raise that awareness? And um, it got me thinking about, I, I, I guess I came back to the idea of how do we talk to young men and, and young women around alcohol, the risks of alcohol to their health? Um, and I think it's about, um, I think there's a message there, if someone has an unplanned pregnancy, you know, it's very clear that we say, okay, so now you know you're pregnant, the best thing you can do is stop drinking alcohol. Um, so that's one of the messages that's being shared, but it, it is that kind of window of time, you know, where there is a risk. And so I think for me, what I see is that it's about raising awareness of the risks of alcohol to health and wellbeing generally. Um, and, and that FASD is part of that conversation. Um, so there's a lot of other issues around alcohol misuse or, or even just, you know, binging on alcohol. Um, and as Sophie said, that only needs to be four standard drinks. So I think there is a role that we, we need to really step into raising that awareness for young people. I also think that we, we don't talk about fathers very often. And, you know, the role of the dad in not drinking and supporting the mother by not drinking is that there is some research in Canada, really, where they talk of uh, alcohol impact on the sperms and the genetics and the sort of looking at the epigenetics and how, uh, you know, if the epigenetics, that is the influence of the nurturing, can impact how alcohol affects the baby to have feet, you know, the risky features or not. So there is a lot of undercurrent, so ongoing research on the genetics of why a mother with who drinks, one of them could have a FASD baby and the other could get away with it. So, so it's still out there because we haven't really got the full picture of why one mother could get a badly damaged baby and the other could get away with the same level of drinking. And that's why it, it becomes really confusing and we need a really consistent message to say no alcohol is the best option. Thank you. I was just reflecting when you were speaking, you know, we got to a point with packets of cigarettes where the, the health warnings are huge. It pretty much is the packet of cigarettes. But if you look at a bottle of alcohol, the warning and suggestion that you don't drink when pregnant is minuscule and hidden in amongst a whole lot of other information. So it'd be amazing if half the label on any bottle of alcohol was don't drink if you're pregnant. Can I respond to that? Yeah. To respond to that? Just, just, and that's a really good point, actually, Emily, because it was of the 1st of August this year that it was, became mandatory that there had to be the clear label on all alcohol products. So as you say, it's not like a cigarette packet where you see a baby on a ventilator across the whole of the packet, but that was a 12-year struggle, a fight, I would say, to get to that point. Um, and it now has a red circle and a red line through it, and it says that it's a pregnancy health warning label. And realistically, until you have something as basic as that, you cannot put that message out there and make people believe it, that alcohol is a poison to a developing fetus. So that was a really powerful move to make that happen. And many, I think it's a great effort. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone here? No, I'll add a, ask, uh, some extension to that. 
this um, prevalence is around 5% of the population. Uh, that's a really significant harm caused by the alcohol industry, uh, knowingly. And um, what, what would you think would be the next steps in terms of regulation or, or labelling? What would that look like in terms of harm minimisation relating to alcohol? Again, if our funding was unlimited or if we could do that, what would we do? Can I speak as Sophie rather than Sophie from No FASD Australia? Um, that campaigning by many across that more than a decade of time to get the alcohol label was fought strongly by alcohol lobbying groups. Uh, with comments made, um, I won't say who made the comment, but along the lines of that, well, if we put a red circle on a line through it, it suggests it's like poison. Um, I won't say what words I use to respond to, to that idea, but until that message is out there, it's tough to do. So with no, no limitations, no boundaries, it's about having an even clearer message. It's about, in my opinion, uh, you know, the alcohol companies actually funding that health prevention message from a point of view for all of society. I also live in the real world, and though that's probably not gonna happen, but I think far more regulation in the future absolutely has to happen in that space. Um, that probably doesn't totally answer your question, but I'm being a little bit careful what I say at this point and what I would like to say. Mm. I'd also like to respond to that and say, I think more generally in our society, you know, we, we see the influence of the alcohol industry, not, not e even like if we think about how hard they pushed against that campaign, but just the pervasiveness of alcohol, linkage with sport, promotions and so on. Um, and it just contributes to this overall normalization of alcohol consumption in our community. So I, I think that, yeah, if, if funding was not an issue, um, I think, but it's, it's also about that influence at that governmental level as well, to increasingly reinforce a message that, you know, alcohol is a harmful substance. We need to, we, we need to use it with care um, and, and to bring that message to the forefront and really have more controls around the influence of the alcohol industry in a lot of different spaces in our society. I'd, I'd like to add to that and just think not just about alcohol, but all the substances. With the substance abuse in pregnancy can have similar effects. Alcohol is the one which has been tested and we know the documentation, but we really don't have an idea what methamphetamines, what weed, what all the substances young people use when they're pregnant, actually what is the impact. So, we're going to learn about that over the years, but I'm also hopeful because the cigarettes thing took 20, 25 years to actually come onto that package, right? So hopefully at some point, alcohol would also be something that we can think, because I remember sitting in planes where people were smoking in the back, you have to go to the toilet, you could get the whole pass, passive, passive smoking, so, you know? Do we have any online questions? No, we could. You guys have been very thorough, clearly. I'd like to make a statement, if I may. Yes, like of course. I, I guess I just want to say, because we're talking about the impacts, we're talking about deficits, we're talking about challenges and the struggles. I, I would like just to say, yeah, in terms of when I think about my own son and the families that we support and we engage with, as you saw when Jessica was spoke, speaking, um, there are so many strengths for individuals. It's just because we don't look for them because we don't expect to look for them. And a comment that um, I, think, um, I think you made before was around looking at expectations and changing expectations. And that's, that's the reality. When we know that somebody has a FASD diagnosis or we suspect they may have, putting the right interventions in place, putting the right supports in place and changing our expectations changes their lives and our lives and that certainly is something we hear continuously and when you see somebody like Jessica or you see Jessica speak her super strength is her ability to speak and to articulate her words that's not my son's strength but if you ask him to watch YouTube videos repetitively he'll rebuild a, rebuild, rebuild a motorbike for you but he couldn't read the manual to do it not because he can't read because he's a great reader but he can't comprehend what he reads and follows through. So I just wanted to mention that because I think it's really important we recognise the strengths and it's about us making accommodations and changes too. And then the individual policy, I think, man is cool. And I guess I'm just 
going off that something that I'm really passionate about within um, advocacy, not necessarily labels. Unfortunately, our community are so, to get funding is so deficit based, isn't it? Um, one of the things that I always say when I advocate for any child, not, not regardless of the labels, just looking at the symptoms and their experiences, are that if in today's society, if we have an individual who is in a wheelchair, no question that's asked, we would build them a ramp. We would never say, just go to lots of physio, you will learn to walk again. Yeah. We would never say that. <laughs> we would have an uproar if these days in 2023 we have a place that is not wheelchair accessible friendly. Um, why would we expect that of you know, disability? Um, so, you know, it's such a tool for things that because then, you know, it's that I often think about when you guys were saying about um, preventative stuff. It's like, you know, I, I've you know, been with lots of people where they have gone through their antenatal appointments where um, oftentimes you would say, do not eat raw fish and soft cheese and hysteria. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I think it's, it, you know, we kind of have to have the same message with alcohol, isn't it? Um, because we focus so much on raw fish, soft cheese, and even the, do you know, you have to take folic acid before conception, not after. So it's kind of like, well, alcohol is a no-brainer. <laughs> we really look at the, uh, the symptoms that are probably not as harmful, still harmful. Um, you know, there is lots of talks about mysteria for as long as we know about the soft cheeses, raw fish, and, you know, daily food. <laughs> Um, but not alcohol. Um. <laughs> and just on that, around about seven people a year from research um, it demonstrates uh, will be exposed to listeria. Eleven, around about seven babies. Around about 15,500 babies will be exposed to alcohol and have FASD. That's right. That's right. Hmm. Thank you. I'm just reflecting on, you know, you're talking through the sort of the diagnostic criteria and some of the presentations, um, behavioural and cognitive and um, and executive functioning. And these are issues that we often see in children for a variety of reasons. And I was just thinking about a barrier-free world where every child has an individual management plan in the school system and that every child um, has the potential to have um, really clear routines, really clear instructions, um, periods of time out, that anyone would benefit from that, whether or not uh, there is some sort of disability. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's been very informative um, and really appreciate that you've brought so many different perspectives to the conversation today. We will wrap up the formal side of things now. We have some afternoon tea here. There is a table full of resources that you're welcome to take as many copies as you like. If they don't go, we'll just have to pack them up and take them back to the office. So please feel free. Um, if there are particular resources you would like more copies of that, um, and there aren't enough here today, please come back to Den um, and we'll coordinate through Sophie if there are no FASD resources um, to get them to you. Thank you again, everybody, um, and please help yourself to something to eat.